today. So who is really feeling the pinch? Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics, well known as Post, covering finance and property news. Today, I want to update you from my surveys, specifically looking at how households are coping with all the financial pressures that they're being confronted with. But just before we get into that, it's just worth noting here the context, because of course, one of the big questions is what's going to happen to interest rates ahead. And looking at the coverage in the media recently, well, you'd think perhaps there are some questions. This article recently highlighted the fact that because house prices are so strong, it could well be that in fact rate cuts are going to be delayed. And in fact, that's a theme that we're seeing more and more coming through. Here's another example. The RBA could be the last to cut rates, was an exclusive in one paper. And Chris Richardson was also arguing that if you're dreaming of rate cuts, you need to dream on because we're unlikely to get rate relief before the Americans do. There is some very significant economic drivers. Long-suffering borrowers are praying for an interest rate cut from the RBA, but hard economics will have the final say. Now, that doesn't stop the spruiking, of course, because we also are now saying in other articles, well, the mood is building for interest rate cuts and the RBA has turned corners on rates. All signs point to a cut. Well, maybe my argument is simply this. There is significant pressure on the RBA currently. And in fact, if you read carefully between the lines of their statement, they did keep everything on the table, including rate hikes and the prospect of rate cuts, I think, are becoming more dim and distant, so higher for longer. And of course, that's going to impact many households with mortgages because the expectation has been for quite some time that in fact rates will get cut soon. Well, while the spruiking is still there trying to convince everybody that the RBA is going to cut, the truth is, I think, rather different. Now, as we progress with the conversation, it's also worth noting this, that in fact, in some parts of the country, we're seeing investors fleeing. So there was a headline here recently saying investors flee as rents rise 11% in Victoria. That's according to the NAB. Whereas, of course, in Perth, it's maybe a different story. Perth is delivering for East Coast investors, said CoreLogic. And there are some very strong differences between what's going on in different locations across the country at the moment. But as we come back to issues of financial stress and pressure, the truth is that even in the West, financial pressures are continuing to build. So again, it's a matter of trying to get a balanced view of what's precisely going on. And this is another rather important factor, which is worth highlighting before we get into the detail, that if you look in some of the outer suburban areas, where there's been considerable building of properties, the truth is, of course, there isn't much in the way of infrastructure. So this article is suggesting that in Box Hill, people are being let down by the empty promises. The parents in Sydney's booming northwest are being forced to make 90-minute round trips to pick up their children from their catchment primary school after the state failed to deliver on any of its promises for education in the area. And this is a really important point because, of course, what we're finding is that a lot of the financial pressures on households are not directly linked to the mortgages alone, but linked to the lifestyle that's being created by the fact that the infrastructure has not been provided and that people are having to spend a lot of money and time and effort traveling around just to get by. And when I measure stress, I try and take account of all of those factors, not just the interest rate payments on mortgages. So with that context, let me just remind you that we, of course, survey our households on an ongoing basis. And this allows us to update our models each month. We've updated it to the end of March. We can slice and dice the data lots of different ways. And this gives us insights, not just at the aggregate level, but down to the postcode level. And that allows us also to take a view of where things might go next from a scenario perspective. And that means that we can take the mortgage stress data, the price trajectory history data, the buying and selling intentions, the migration information, the economic information more broadly, putting into the core market model and the scenarios. And then we can look at it at a postcode level 
and also roll it up to regions, states and all Australia. And that, of course, is the information that we share each month. And this is a start of a process, by the way, because there is so much to share that this initial post will cover the high level highlights. And then there'll be more posts later and a live show next Tuesday when I can go down to the postcode level. Before I get started, just also remind you that I'm still providing my one to one service. And if you want an individual confidential discussion with me about a particular suburb, I can do that. I can't provide financial advice, but I can look at the underlying trends based on my data. I can look at the stress information, the price information, and also think about where things might be heading based on the modeling. Now you can book a time to have a Zoom conversation or a phone conversation with me up to an hour an hour. There is a cost involved simply because of the fact there's a lot of work to do to be able to put the information together. And I'm booking at the moment three to five weeks ahead because I've got a lot of demand for this particular service. But if you are interested, go across to my blog and you can send me a message there. Anyway, let me now talk about the stress situation and just on the definition of stress, there are clearly many different definitions out there from 30% of income or after taxable income through to various underwriting metrics. We have defined stress in cash flow terms. If households have more outgoings, excluding one off discretionary items and income, we define those stressed. If they have the mortgage, then they're in mortgage stress. If they're renting, then rental stress. Investors are also under the gun sometimes. And if they've got cash flow pressures, they're identified as stressed investors. And we can also aggregate the data to estimate total financial stress. We can look at the information as a percentage of households and account. I continue to argue that the best way to look at it is the rule of big numbers. So it is about where are the largest counts of households. And I tend to report that in my information flows. Now, another way to think about stress is to look at it. This is the RBA chart on the spectrum of household financial stress. So at the mild end of the spectrum, there might be initial budget pressures, money in, money out being a problem. And then you grade through into missing payments. And ultimately, severe stress includes insolvency or maybe forced sales. But it does actually beg the question, so how many people are under pressure at the moment? Well, if you take the RBA's word for it, they recently published a report suggesting that only one in 20 mortgaged households, 5%, have cash flow issues. And uh, I think that that is an interesting observation. They do actually note that about 5% of variable rate owner-occupied borrowers are spending more than they earn, which the bank says is leading to an estimated cash shortfall. In addition to cutting back spending, these households have had to make other adjustments to continue servicing their mortgages. The report said those include drawing on savings, selling assets and working additional hours and lower income borrowers are more likely to be in this group. Now, I made a show where I went through this information now, if you take 20%, one in five, that means around 175,000 mortgage households, that's a variable rate mortgage, have a cash flow problem. Well, my own view is that absolutely is understating the story. And to develop that further, Roy Morgan says it's more like 1.6 million households with mortgage stress. And this is their latest chart. And it shows that there's a significant peak. And they break out those at risk and those extremely at risk. And those numbers are higher than they've been for quite some time. In fact, if you go back to the global financial crisis, there was a slightly higher percentage, but the numbers now are a lot larger. I think Roy Morgan is probably closer to the truth than the RBA, but they, of course, do have a slightly different definition of how stress is measured. And that's part of the problem. But I have to say the RBA seems to me to be understating the problem. I wonder why that is. And here's another take on it. Victoria's recorded the country's largest jump in financial distress, with 54% of Victorians now say they're experiencing hardship beyond normal levels. That's according to a Nine News report recently. Now, I think, that, again, that's getting closer to the truth. And Tarek made this interesting commentary relating to the Finder report, where 45% of people don't have $1,000 savings, and yet the average on some metrics is over 30,000, and this is part of the problem. Aggregates and averages tell you things are great, but the median tells things rather differently and is much more challenges. And, uh, of course, some people are still saying, well, we've got superannuation, but, of course, superannuation cannot be accessed. 
And here's another take. This is actually reported from the Australian Financial Complaints Authority and the ABC, saying that complaints about how banks have handled financial distress rose 25% last year, according to the report. More than half of the complaints were about a lender's failure to respond to a request for help, which is a breach of the national codes. And by the way, ASIC is also now conducting a review of financial hardship applications. Now, the hardship numbers might be relatively low, but again, it's worth noting that this is at the end of the system. This is very much uh, the last thing that people do. And I will make uh, a further comment on this later in the show, because I think there's some quite important learnings that we can uh, take away. Anyway, let's look at the mortgage stress data for March 2024. And as normal, I'm going to start with the aggregate average. And the first thing is that rental stress is up again. It's now 75% of households with rents are struggling with cash flow to make those payments. So it continues to be a real issue. Of course, inflation was last reported at 7.4% annualized rental increases. And uh, for many people, the average increases were a lot higher than that. That's a real problem. It's putting huge pressure on a lot of households. The mortgage stress is just a little bit down, but it's still at 49.7%. So just under half of households on my modeling have cash flow issues relating to their mortgage payments. Doesn't mean they're defaulting, it means they're having to cut back elsewhere to make those payments. And the RBA continues to report the debt to income ratio is relatively high. Of course, this is out of date now, it relates to the September period. The next data will come out shortly. But again, if you look at debt to income ratio, it's higher than it's been if you look back over the earlier part of the decade. And the other point, of course, this is average across all households, whether they've got a mortgage or not. So really, you need to understand that about a third of people have mortgages. So the true situation is that it's a much higher proportion than they show. Now, here is the latest data for March. And again, I'm displaying this information at a state level. And you can see where I've highlighted in yellow where the measures have gone up compared with last month. So in mortgage stress, the NT and Victoria have seen a rise in mortgage stress. Well, in some other states, there's been a fall. And that's partly because incomes have increased slightly. There's been a little bit of adjustment with regard to the fixed and variable rate mortgages. And also people are working more hours to get by. But nevertheless, 49.7% of households are in mortgage stress, and that translates to 1.7 million households. So I'm very much in line with the Roy Morgan analysis, which had, which had 1.63 million households. Now, in rental stress, which is also something which I focus on significantly, because for me, this is the immediate and dire story. You can see that rental stress, other than the Northern Territory, was up across the board with 75.44% of households. That now translates to more than 2.3 million households in rental stress. This is a disaster because a lot of households who are renting are in a more dire financial situation before they start. Stressed investors are up and down a little bit with a rise in Queensland, South Australia and Tasmania, but a slight fall in some of the other places. Nevertheless, we've got 22% of investors struggling, and notably that translates to around 644,000. But I would also highlight that 20% of those are in Victoria with 150,000, and we are seeing a lot of stressed investors in Victoria wanting to get out simply because they can't make it work anymore. And if you aggregate that all up, the financial stress comes out at 48.67% with rises in New South Wales, South Australia, Tasmania and Victoria, and slight falls in the ACT, Northern Territories, Queensland, and also Western Australia. And if you take that aggregate number, 48.67% of households translates to 4.7 million households with some degree of financial pressure on them. That, of course, means that slightly more than half are in okay state though. Now if we look at it in terms of our segments, and again I've just highlighted in yellow the highest proportion, you can see there that the battling urban, those on the urban fringe, and also young growing families is where a lot of the mortgage stress lives. 88% plus of young growing families, including first-time buyers of course. If you look at rental stress, 
then it's multicultural establishment, first generation Australians who are at the top of the list, followed by the more mature, stable families. But you can see there that rental stress lives pretty much wherever you look. And again, young growing families and young affluents, even wealthy seniors are significantly under pressure. But I also highlight that stressed seniors are feeling it as well. Looking at the investor stress, young affluents and exclusive professionals register with the most significant pressure. That's because they have more properties. And I'd make the point that young affluents tend to have less experience of managing investment properties, so they tend to be in more strife. Exclusive professionals are often quite well leveraged up, and what they're finding quite often is that they can solve their problem by selling properties. But nevertheless, we see there's a significant issue here. And overall, if you aggregate it all up, financial stress is highest among young growing families at 67%, and that's more than 493,000 households. And then 58% amongst the battling urban, 248,000. But I would highlight that the cohort with the significant count at highest levels is the disadvantaged fringe. So that's on the outer suburban areas around our suburbs particularly our main urban centres, where incomes are under pressure, where costs of living are still rising, and where the financial basis on which they manage their finances are under severe pressure. Now, here is the mortgage stress information, and I'll just call out the top postcodes. So Liverpool, postcode 2170, Campbelltown, another New South Wales, postcode 2560, and then across to Western Australia, 6065, which includes Wanneroo. And then up to Toowoomba, so regional centres as well being impacted, 4350. And then back to New South Wales, Camden. And then Roxburgh Park, Narrowarren, Pakenham, Cranbourne, Berwick, all suburban areas within Victoria where there's been a high growth corridors, lots of new properties, lots of first time buyers. And then we go to regional areas like Ballarat, 3350 then back to 3029, and then Sydenham 3037, and then across to Western Australia again. And I want to highlight just how many of these postcodes are in Victoria, where we are seeing huge pressure on mortgage households. If we then look at rental stress, again, Liverpool is at the top of the list, 2170, followed by the centre of Melbourne, 3000. Now that's the first time I think those two have switched around. Then Toowoomba, 4350, and then Southport, 4215, and then Wentworthville, Waterloo and Zetland, Hoppers Crossing, Point Cook, Derrimont, and then Coomera, Campbelltown, Bundaberg in Queensland, Mount Druitt in New South Wales, Ipswich, Blacktown, Parramatta, and Highgate Hill in Queensland. We then look at stressed investors. The centre of Melbourne is uh, top of the list. Then Queen Bian in the ACT. Now that's partly being driven by some of the changes to the way that the rents are managed in the ACT, I think. Then we go to South Australia, Ob Flat, and then Strathfield, Wentworth Villa, New South Wales, Service Paradise in Queensland, Fortitude Valley in Queensland, Cranbourne in Victoria, Devonport in Tasmania. I'm seeing lots of pressure in that particular area at the moment. Matraville in New South Wales, DY. In New South Wales, another postcode up in Queensland, 4570, then St Kilda in Victoria, Hornsby, New South Wales, and Southport. Again, showing on the list at 4215. And if we look at it in aggregate stress terms, Toowoomba's at the top of the list, then Liverpool, Campbelltown, Victorian postcodes at Tarnet, Melbourne, Cranbourne, Derrimont, Roxburgh Park, then Mount George, New South Wales, Southport in Queensland, Blacktown, Ipswich, Ballarat. Camden, Wentworthville, Springfield, and Pakenham. All the old suspects, I'm afraid, but we're seeing it getting more and more severe. And in some cases, you can see there that high proportions of households are in financial stress. And I'll just call out briefly postcode 3000, Melbourne, where more than 80% of households are in difficulty, which is quite close to Mount Druitt and areas around there, including Lethbridge Park and Minchinbury where 85% of households are up against it. And it's fascinating to me that Mount Druitt and the centre of Melbourne are showing similar trends, even if the demographics are quite different. 
Now, it's worth noting again that mortgage delinquencies have reached their fastest pace in the last two years. That was recent mortgage-backed securities information. And it's interesting that investors are somewhat riskier than occupiers, according to some analysts, because investors, of course, have more opportunity to walk away. So watch this space, particularly in Victoria. Now, here is the risk of defaults. And this is my projection ahead. And it's trying to get at where are the highest counts. And you can see there that at the top of the list is Cranbourne, 3977 in Victoria, then Mandurah in Western Australia, Roxburgh Park in Victoria, Tarnit in Victoria, Success in Western Australia, and another postcode in Australia, Armadale, then Mid-North Coast, Gosford, Toowoomba in Queensland, Wanneroo in Western Australia, and Bundaberg in Queensland, Derrimont Point Cook in Victoria, Sampson in Western Australia, Mount Claremont, and then Pacific Pines in Queensland. Now those are my projections over the next 12 months as to the highest counts. And you know, not huge percentages, until you actually look at 6010, where it looks pretty bad, but uh, we'll see. This is a projection. It's an estimate. It's based on where we think mortgage rates might be going ahead. Now, in terms of our scenarios, again, the scenarios are a way of thinking about the future. They're not forecasts. They're not estimates. None of these scenarios may be right, but we do have three scenarios. The first scenario is the Goldilocks zone, where we see rates sticking around at 4.35%. Don't go any higher, but they fall later in the year with inflation easing ahead of expectations, with rate rises still running fast, no recession, and migration remains above average. The base case is a soft landing where rates stay at 4.35% into 2024, and inflation falls a bit, but start to rise again, thanks to the stubbornness of services inflation and higher wage rises, and some of the international transference. And it stays above target. In fact, inflation until 2025. There's no recession in Australia, but more right. But migration falls to average. And the worst is a nightmare scenario where you see rate rises above 4.35%, which would, of course, put mortgage rates up. Stay high through 2024, along with inflation. Unemployment rises. Wages growth stalls due to recession here in Australia. Rates fall later. And migration drops below average. So those are the three I use. Clearly, you could build other scenarios, but they're the ones I choose to run with. And just to give you a bit of a sense of what that means, so this is Western Australia. So Western Australia, on the best case scenario, is likely to see house price growth over the next three years. And even in the base case, there's still some further growth, although in the worst case scenario, there'd be a bit of a fall. And on units, not quite so much growth or not quite so much a fall, but still Western Australia looks pretty powerfully strong in my scenarios. Compare that with Tasmania, where even in the best case scenario, we don't see much in the way of growth, maybe 4.6% for houses over the next three years. The base case is a significant fall, and the worst case is a dramatic fall. Units, quite a similar trend, maybe the fall not quite so exaggerated. If we look again at Victoria, even in the best case scenario, not much in the way of price rises. The latest from CoreLogic suggested that there was no movement over the last three months. And even in the best case scenario, I don't think we're going to see very much, maybe 4% over three years. The base case is a fall, and the worst case is a more significant fall. Units following the trend, maybe not quite such a steep fall, simply because of strong demand and more ability to pay. And we also look at New South Wales, where in the best case scenario, there's still some upside potentially, maybe 13% over the next three years. The base case is a bit of a fall down 6% over three years. The worst case, a more significant fall. Units following the same trend, but not falling quite as much. And just to, to finish it off, look at Queensland, very strong growth in the best case scenario for houses. The base case, a bit of a fall, and the worst case, a more significant fall. Units following the same sorts of trends, but not falling quite so much in the worst case scenario. Again, these are just indicative. They're not accurate in any way. They're just showing you the sensitivities. Now, before I close off, I'll show you that young growing families are also under the gun. So how could home prices move? Well, the best case is a rise of 8% over the next three years. The base case, though, is a fall of about 10%. And the worst case is a fall of up to 30% over the next three years. And on units, quite close, although the truth is that units probably won't quite fall as much simply because of the supply-demand disequilibrium that we've got there. 
Next thing to say is just that I've updated my core market model down to a postcode level. This is the one I use. Happens to be Wollongong, which I know very well, of course. And you can see here that there's still quite a few households in some difficulty. And there are scenarios where prices could rise, but because of the degree of mortgage stress and rental stress that we're seeing, there's potential for significant falls as well. And also make the point once again that the disposable monthly income at more than 43% going on the mortgage and 35% going on the rent is significantly high. And that's a very important leading indicator of pressure ahead. Gross investment yield is about 3.4%. Net investment yield is falling minus 0.4%. So investors in net investment terms in this particular postcode are losing money. And I think it's worth saying that there are many households in many postcodes where there are investors that are actually not being able to get a return on their investment. So they're basically assuming that there's going to be capital appreciation. But if my scenarios prove to be right and we see a fall, then of course that doesn't work. One reason why in some postcodes, including in the around Victoria, people are looking to sell. So that's sort of the top line story in the latest information. It's not a positive story, unfortunately, but I think it's what I'm seeing in my surveys more aligns with what Roy Morgan has been saying than what the RBA has been saying. And just to close this conversation out, let me make this point that there is, of course, help in hand if people have difficulty. And it's very important, I think, that they do reach out. The National Debt Helpline 1-800-007-077 is a very good source of government bank support. And I do warn people not to go and Google help on the internet because you may end up with people who are going to take you for a ride and charge you an arm and a leg for advice. But there's another source which is quite interesting. I mentioned Africa's statement uh, earlier on about the fact that there are more people in financial difficulty. There is a tool called the Statement of Financial Position on the Africa site. And you can actually go and put information in there, household income, living expenses, the property information, other assets, etc., the debts you might have, and how you might think about managing it. That's quite useful. Now, I'm not suggesting you submit it to Africa directly, but the tool itself is quite a good prompt to be able to um, save it by way of a PDF so that you can then complete the form, hand it to your financial firm, or anybody else who's going to help you, such as a financial counsellor. It's a quite a structured way of trying to get to understand how things are actually going. And in fact, this is a sort of a microcosm of the methodology that I use in my surveys, where effectively we capture information on both the assets and liabilities sides of households, and then form a view of what might happen. And that's how we come to a measure of whether they're in stress or whether they're not. So I do recommend that tool. And uh, it's, uh, of course, free, which is also quite helpful. So that completes this particular show. I just want to make three points. The fact of the matter is interest rates are probably not going to get cut anytime soon. There are many more households, I think, in financial pressure than the official story is actually recognising. And whilst there is going to be some improvement with regard to things like tax adjustments and also income growth in the months ahead, and that will have some benefit. I do expect mortgage stress to continue to ease down. I think rental stress will continue, though, to go up or stay at very high levels. And I also believe that it's really important that households take ownership of their own financial position and start tackling their financial flows. And the truth is, of course, that there always are things that can be adjusted. Unfortunately, quite often what happens is that people reach for more credit, buy now, pay later, or even payday loans, or get another loan from the bank, or draw down on equity out of the property, hopefully to get by. I'd also make the other point that banks will often restructure a mortgage and extend the period, but of course that means you pay more interest. And quite often the bank's advice is more about what's in the interest of the bank than the interest of the household. So it's really important that you go armed and understand where you are. Because the bottom line is this, that we are going to see, I think, this financial pressure on households continuing for some time. I also believe that we're not going to see interest rates dropping significantly in the short term, but even in the medium term, they will come back a little bit, but we're never going to see them where they were at the peak of the COVID problem, where rates were cut way too low. So we are in a new world, a new world where interest rates are going to be higher. And of course, households are more indebted. That's going to put more pressure on households. That's going to flow into more economic impact 
on the broader economy. And that's why I believe that growth will be quite slow in the months and years ahead. So the bottom line is this. It's important to plan and act and to manage your finances because you can't expect the RBA to play a get out of jail card anytime soon. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.